Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com and we're going to continue on in our look at Christian liberty. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. I'll go ahead and, and read that. Uh, might put that up here on the screen. Stand fast therefore in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Some believe that verse 1 is really the last verse of the last chapter. This epistle, of course, is the Holy Spirit's most important work. You might even say, a masterpiece against law and the contrast of law and grace. Not against in the sense that, that there is anything bad about the law, but the contrast between law and grace, which is why I chose this to be part two in our study of Christian liberty. In this epistle, the epistle to the Galatians, the Holy Spirit explains by use of an allegory the case of Abraham and his two sons, Isaac and Ishmael, one born after the flesh and the other born after the Spirit, where at the end he says, Nevertheless, what saith the Scriptures, cast out the bondwoman and her son? For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. Now, we know that in Abraham's day, Moses had not yet written the Pentateuch. And so we have what the Holy Spirit says, the Scriptures say, and what we are quoting. Our conversation between... Sarah and Abraham and casting out Hagar and her son because Sarah saw Ishmael despising or, or ridiculing Isaac. It was about a 14-year difference in these two kids. From the human standpoint, you probably wouldn't have expected much different, but from, you know, kids just do that. But from God's standpoint, this was all planned by God that we might have a marvelous lesson that there are children of the flesh and there are children of promise. And it would be a great mistake to miss that truth and not see what the Holy Spirit is doing here. And I want you to note that the context of this, okay, the context deals with the entire, I guess what you'd call spectrum of, Christ, of the Christian life. Both justification and sanctification. Galatians deals heavily with both matters. So that's the context. I've spent some time on, on the subject of redemption where that God basically says, if, if you don't believe in election, you know, that I have the right to choose one and reject another, well, I, well I'll just place twins in Rebecca's womb and I'll say Jacob I loved and Esau I hated, you know, where, the, you know, down through the centuries, you can say, well, I, you know, say something that I didn't say, which is that, you know, I really didn't hate you know, Esau, I just didn't love him as much as Jacob, but that's not what I said. You know, the human nature just automatically is repulsed at that statement. Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. But that's what God said. And I, for one, can't take and twist the words to make them say something that they didn't say. This is God's Word. 
And you either believe what he said or you don't. So though that has to do with election, the picture of Abraham and Sarah has to do with law and grace as well. How we were born again, how we are to live, the same principle of grace, of our growing in grace and, and knowledge of Jesus Christ, our Lord. We come to the fifth chapter, 5-1. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and do not again be entangled in a yoke of bondage. Folks, he that was born by the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. But as then, he which persecuteth him that was born after the Spirit, so it is now. That is, the flesh persecutes the Spirit. We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Now, you could look at verse 30, and what you could say is, is that anyone who is legalistic is going to go to hell. I mean, you could say that, but I don't think that you could say that in the context of the passage. You know, it'd be terrible to think that everybody who taught that you had to be water baptized in order to be redeemed or that you had to be circumcised in order to be redeemed went to hell. There is a possibility which I believe fits the allegory. And that is that what we're looking at here are two men. Okay? Two men. Flesh and spirit. Your old man and your new man. How did you get flesh? The works of the flesh are manifest. What are these? And we can see them in the fifth chapter. Where did that all come from? Where did it come from? Satan in the fall. The flesh is not going to be an heir with the Spirit. You know, what a marvelous, marvelous truth. What a tremendous load is lifted from our shoulders when, when a person comes to realize that it's the new creation that's redeemed, not the old. Are you following me? Much of modern Christianity, at least in their focus, is trying to make the old man righteous. But it's the new man that's going to go to heaven. So, you know, are we to clean up the old man? You know, that, that God says we're, we're going to finally be cut loose from or delivered from when He returns at the rapture, which we're all waiting for anxiously, all that, try, all that time trying to clean up the flesh that isn't going to go to heaven anyway? Nevertheless, what saith the Scriptures? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman, that's the flesh, born after the flesh, shall not, absolutely not, in the Greek, it's a double negative in the English, but in the Greek, we simply emphasize it. The son of the bondwoman shall never, ever, ever, ever be heir with the son of the free woman. Now, the trouble is, that's the English, but when I look at the Greek, though then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman. Absolutely, emphatically, not. The, the Greek word not, may, I believe, is the word. Uh, it's a very emphatic not. And I believe that we're looking at the old man and the new man. We're not looking at people going to heaven or people going to hell. We're looking at the old man and the new man. And we know from Romans 6.11 that we are to reckon ourselves dead to, to sin, the sin nature. Just like in Hebrews where it says to lay aside that, that sin nature. That's another, that's another video. That which, which so easily you know, entangles us. You know, there's many areas of, of humanism legalism 
but we are children of the free. One's articulated, the other's not. The Holy Spirit wants to emphasize, He wants to push upon our, our minds that we are, folks, listen to me, we are children of promise. And, and I venture to say that most of modern Christianity, most, says that you're God's children because you decided to be. How do I become God's child? Well, you come down the, down the aisle and you accept the preacher's hand and well, first you're moved by some very uh, emotional music. You come down the aisle, you walk the aisle, you take the preacher's hand, you profess Christ. That's modern Christianity and that is not biblical. Folks, you are children of promise. God promised you to Christ before the worlds began, before He placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, you were promised to Christ. As a child of promise, however, you are now persecuted by Him that is born after the flesh. That's your flesh, not just somebody outside of you persecuting you. Though I believe both are true, I can't deny the fact both are true, but the context here is not Christian persecution. The context, folks, is dealing with how we are to live and walk as children of the promise, walking in the Spirit as opposed to walking in the flesh. Okay? Free woman as, as compared to bond woman. The promise came through the son of the free woman. We are children of the free woman, not the bond woman. Spirit, not flesh. New man, not old man. I read a number of commentators that, that, that suggest that this is someone outside of you persecuting you. But you don't have to read very far, folks, into the fifth chapter here in Galatians to see that the flesh lusts against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh so that you cannot do the things that you would. I believe the persecution, the primary persecution, is our present context. You know, in, that, in this present context is that conflict that exists in you. You. Between flesh and Spirit. You can listen to a thousand sermons and you can read a thousand books where people are unwilling to take that last step that God, that, that, and say that God actually did it all in Christ. You are not going to be an heir of the free woman because of anything you did. That's, in fact, that's the grand climax of the book of Galatians, which might be our next verse by verse study on this channel. I haven't been led there yet, but Galatians is just one of many, if not all, epistles that declare in, in unambiguous terms that you belong to Christ and that you are children of promise. You're children of promise, not because you believe, not because you received, not because you repented, not because you were baptized, not because you uh, filled out a little form and became a church member, or anything else. No work of the flesh is of any merit with God. You are children of promise. That which is of the flesh will be cast out. None of it is a part of the inheritance. That's the grand truth. We're not children of flesh. We're children of spirit. In Romans chapter 9, these who were, who were born after the flesh, these are not the sons of God, but the children of promise are counted for the seed. Who made the promise? Well, God did. And it is non-biblical to suggest that what God promised was that if you would believe, He would make you His Son. Okay? That is humanism. The flesh cannot please God. The, it is not subject to the law of God. In fact, the flesh is God's enemy. It is heresy, pure, 
unadulterated heresy to teach that the, that the flesh can do something that leads God to make you a new creation in Christ. The only, the only, you're talking about an unredeemed individual, one that's not yet saved, that's coming down to be saved, doing something, anything, fill in the blank, to be to become a child of God, to be to be become redeemed. Therefore, the action on the part of that unsaved individual is an action of the flesh. They're trying to get. Uh, they're tr they're they're tr they're trying to bring about a response, a reaction from the individual that is purely of the flesh, because the person's not yet saved. So whatever that person does is of the flesh. I know that's folks I know and I've been for three years now, if you've been following this channel, you know that I have hammered that point home. Why? Because it's the gospel. The gospel is what Christ did, not what we do. Oh, but Steve, I, I, I did. I know, I, I know, I was there. I remember, I accepted Christ. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. Glad you did. But the only way that you, you, you could have come to do that is because Jesus Christ died in your place. Okay? It, it, you've got to get away from the... Reverse your thinking here. It's not about cause and effect. It's not about you did something in the flesh whereby God then did something in the Spirit. What you did, what you did, was you did something in the Spirit because God did something in the Spirit. There was the action that you did, whatever you, whatever you did, except repent, believe, receive, whatever you did was a result of what Christ had... It came about as a result of what Christ had already done. And you're trying to take credit for it. Please, folks, listen to what the words that I'm saying. I'm not leading you astray on this. The flesh can't please God. It's not subject to the law of God. Jesus said, if you were my sheep, you would believe. It's the redeemed who believe. It's the redeemed who receive because they're children of promise. And since you are children of promise, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not a, a, entangled again with the yoke of bondage. There's all kinds of activities of the flesh. But there's only one promise. You were promised to Christ in the decrees of God. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Now, has He made you free or not? The word made free is an aorist active. He really did it. He's not going to do it over again. He's not going to do it over and over again. And by far and away, the modern thought is that this is... This is a come and go thing. You know, sometimes you're free, sometimes you're not. You know, and every time you're not, well, you got to be made free again. And folks, that would require Christ to die again. If we go on reading to the ninth verse, we see that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. You know, it's, it's probably a good thing that we don't meet together in a physical structure, brick and mortar, you know, building Sunday after Sunday. Because if we did, well, my, my dear brother Jeff out there, he, he would be one of the best dressed guys in the church, I expect. You know, he'd probably show up in a white shirt and a tie and a coat, you know, marvelous, immaculate, you know. And then after a while, he'd get rid of the tie. And then eventually the white shirt, that, that would go. And, and then the coat where he didn't look like all the rest of us. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. 
If you have to accept Jesus Christ in order to be redeemed, I'm going to call that leaven. If that's true, then the old man has to be able to do something that pleases God. And since the Word says it can't, folks, if you can do something to be redeemed, you can do something to be unredeemed. You know, which would mean Christ has to die again, which again violates biblical truth. And all of your theology collapses. You don't have any Bible. You don't have any, any canon of truth because one false doctrine destroyed the entire lump. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Christ did it. He's the one that made us free. He's the one that made us righteous. And it's an heiress tense. He did it once. We are then given a present imperative, a command to stand in that liberty. And somebody says, well, Steve, you know, God doesn't change. You know, and he says that a woman shouldn't wear that which pertains to a man. Therefore, it's wrong for women to wear pants. Well, my first comment would be that, that most of the pants that I see women wear, I'd never wear in a thousand years. But that's beside the point. And when, and when somebody says that to me, and I say, we're not under law, we're under grace, they say, God doesn't change. And if God didn't like women wearing britches in the Old Testament, well, He doesn't like them wearing britches now. And my answer is, I believe God doesn't change. But did He like pork in the Old Testament? If, if you make me subject to one part of law, you make me subject to all of law, and I am to stand firmly in the freedom. And what is freedom? What does freedom mean? What does liberty mean? Well, surely that word doesn't mean, you know, I want to be I want to be careful now. It doesn't mean license. Liberty can't possibly mean license. And it doesn't sound very good if I suggest to you that I think true liberty is the freedom to trust and believe God. You know, that doesn't sound like liberty. That sounds like bondage. It isn't bondage. Bondage is sin. Sin is what holds you in bondage. God isn't looking over your shoulder. Many, many of my Christian friends think that He, he does. Your sin and, and, and iniquity will I remember no more, sought for and not found, buried in the deepest sea. But more than all of that, it's, it's washed so that you stand before Him white as snow. Whiter than snow. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, you are holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And folks, why isn't that good enough? Why are there multiplied thousands of Christians who aren't satisfied with the fact that they're holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight? That they have to do something to make themselves acceptable to God. You know, it even bothers modern preachers. It's just inconceivable that it could be that easy. One of the modern Bible teachers wrote a, a book on easy believism. Well, that's wrong. It isn't, it isn't easy believism. It's nothing. It isn't easy, folks. It's nothing. Easy means that you can do it, but you, know, you don't really got to work very hard at, at doing it. That's the wrong kind of believism. The reason believism is, is more than easy, zero, is because you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. If you are His sheep, you will believe. You do believe. You do not become a believer by believing. That's modern Christianity. You know, if we could just get people to believe, they'd be believers. No, no, no. That's backwards. Folks, you've got to reverse your thinking. If they're already believers, they'll believe. 
Stand firmly in that liberty. Modern Christianity doesn't stand in that liberty. If there is a doctrine of works, that's where, that's where they stand. That's what they stand in. You know, if you don't believe that, look at, look at, the, at the Mormon church. You know, many years ago, I was working for the, the Bureau of Land Management out in New Mexico, rounding up wild mustangs. And for three weeks, I worked with a group of, of other hired hands, and we had to work together. And, then, and there was one cowboy. I'd go out to dinner with him. And after working together for weeks, he said to me, he said, I finally figured it out. And I said, what are you talking about? Well, he said, I've been, I've been wondering for days what you were. He said, I now know you're a Mormon. Now, I'm sort of embarrassed that somehow in that time we didn't talk about the Lord, but I said, why do you say that? Well, he said, you don't drink, you know, you don't smoke, you don't, you don't do this, and you don't do that. You know, he, he went on with all these, this list of things, all these things I didn't do. And he finally said, you don't even drink Coca-Cola. Well, I, I do drink Dr. Pepper. I don't know why I hadn't had a Dr. Pepper during those few weeks. And I think, you know, isn't that awful? I would hate to think that somebody thought I was a Christian because of my works. People, fo folks, people are more impressed by what you do than by what you say. I think that's somewhere in, in Hezekiah. You know, let me know if you find the verse. That's modern Christianity. It isn't what I do. I, I stand in the liberty of Christ. I said to somebody not too long ago on Facebook, listen, you know, you will not put these people under law as long as I'm around. But, you know, I don't really have that kind of power on social media. But that much I can do. You are not under law, you are under grace. Shall we sin that grace may abound? The Scriptures say, may it never be. And I say to you, if that's what you want to do, go ahead. But you look me in the eye and you tell me honestly that that's what you want to do. And you know you can't. Because of all that God has done for you in Christ, you want to live for Him. You want to do it based on the pure principle of love. Not because you're earning heaven and not because of any other reason, but because you love Him. Because you realize all that He's done for you. God gives us a command to stand firmly in the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free, so He's done it. He, he, he doesn't keep on doing it. It's based upon the solid foundation that He's done it. You have been made free. Whether you act that way, whether you live that way or think that way, you've been set free because of the finished work of Christ. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, we're told that that you were perfected forever by His one sacrifice. You can't argue with one sacrifice. And it seems strange to me that so many Christians can argue with the word forever. If God Almighty looks me in the eye and says, I've been perfected forever, I don't care what you say. I believe Him. I know in my own life I don't act, think, or, or live perfect, but I am. And I'm going to stand in that freedom. He did it. And it is a once for all transaction. Perfected forever. Imagine, and I read article after article where people weasel around, you know, words around. and They weasel around that word forever. I read in 1 John, He that is born of the Spirit does not commit sin. And then I read an article by one of the nation's leading theologians, mind you. 
Now, you want to be careful, he says, with that word cannot. That doesn't mean that, that you cannot sin. It means that, that you cannot con continually, you know, sin. It says, that what it, it says you cannot be continually in sin. Well, folks, I am. You know, you know, I probably shouldn't have told you that. You know, maybe now you'll find another pastor. You'll find another channel to listen to. But for those of you who are not always in sin, if you're not always in sin, I mean, look, you have my greatest respect because now I'll start worshiping you instead of God. It's the new man that can't sin. The old man's going to be cast out. I do the things I would not, and the things I would not, these I do, O wretched man I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death. I thank God by means of Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful that he didn't say by means of my perseverance, my belief, my acceptance, my works. No. By means of who? Jesus Christ. And I have the promise of God that the old man will be cast out. Flesh. That which wasn't born of God and that which had no part in being born of God. That which was born of sin. That's the bondwoman. It's sin. That's bondage, not freedom. Modern intelligent people look at conservative Christians and say, you know, these poor simple children are in bondage under some kind of faith. They're the ones in bondage who fail to see that we are to cast out the bondwoman. The verse doesn't say, I was set free, but I was made to be free. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Why then should I become entangled again in the yoke of bondage? Well, suppose I do. Am I no longer free? Have I then somehow annulled the, the finished work of Jesus Christ? Erased all the work that He's done in my life? Somehow in your mind, if you could visualize, I don't know how many people are God's people, but there is a, a, a great multitude of people headed for heaven for one reason only, because, and that is because they're, they're God's children. And He redeemed them in Jesus Christ and set them free. He made them free made them righteous, made them new creations in Him, and that new creation is bound for glory. The great bulk of them, of these ones bound for glory, the great bulk of them in bondage. I can't take this passage to say that those who are entangled again and in the yoke of bondage are going to go to hell. Okay? I can't do that. But I do believe that you, whoever you are, you have a new man and you have an old man. Where you can't always do the things that you want. Here is a command not to be entangled again. Well, that means every one of us was once entangled. The day that you came to understand who you were. That God made you a new creation in Christ. I believe is the term salvation. Deliverance in the Word of God. And I don't believe the word salvation means that at that instant you were redeemed. There was the... Listen, folks, there was a fellow named Saul. He was on the road to, to Damascus. You know the story. He was on that road to persecute those who profess to be new creations in Christ Jesus. That's, that's you. That's like you. Now, he was a new creation in Christ Jesus, promised to Christ before the foundation of the world, elect by God, chosen, made righteous, and he's going to kill God's people. That's what this book says. And on the road to Damascus, his eyes were opened and he recognized the, the bondage of sin. And the Holy Spirit use, used Paul, you, he uses his life to rejoice in the liberty and the freedom that he has in Christ. 
it was God who opened his eyes, not some minister of the gospel. It's another point. It's I don't teach you folks anything. It was God who opened Paul's eyes. Okay? God did that. It's God who opens our eyes. Not some minister of the gospel. Not some YouTube preacher. Not some friend. Not some family member. But God. I do not believe Paul was redeemed on the road to Damascus, but I do believe Paul's eyes were open to the redemption that was his in Christ. And he was delivered from the bondage of sin. It would appear in Acts that he went back in bondage. You see then, brother Saul, how many brethren are zealous for the law and we ask you don't hurt their feelings. And he went into the temple to make a sacrifice which would have blasphemed the very liberty that he, he, he was preaching. God stopped it. I'm not sure Paul didn't go back into bondage. It bothers me a bit. You know, if Paul could think how easily, if just think about it, folks. If Paul could, I'm not saying he did. It seems he did. But if Paul could, think how easily it would be for any one of us to conclude that in, in an order to be saved, in order to be redeemed, in order to go to heaven, we got to do something. And I believe more and more as I study the context of this. He that is born after the flesh is my old man. He that is born after the Spirit is my new creation. And then there's me. The mysterious third person. Why do I say that? I, I'm hoping to talk about that in a future video. Because the, the term new creation is not synonymous with new man. New creation, new man. Not identical terms. They're distinctly separate terms. I am not my old man, okay? I'm neither my old man or my new man. That may shock some of you to hear me say that. Notice that I had to employ the word my in the sentence. I'm rather a new, I am a new creation. That's the third person. In possession of both an old and a new man. And I believe that's, that's what Scripture affirms. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Keep washing them hands. Stay close to God in prayer. I do believe we're still going home soon. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.